My name is Jim Fournier. I've been working on biochar for about six years. Uh, this talk is going to go over some of the main motivation I had in getting into it in the first place in terms of biochar's role in managing global carbon. Um, much of what I'm basing this on, it goes back to a paper that came out in August, um, published by, um, written by Dominic Wolf, Jim Annette, and a number of other people, uh, showing the comparison between using biochar and simply burning biomass. And this is the, the first paper that has really gone through the, the work to show quantitatively what that, that difference looks like. Uh, but I actually want to go beyond what was in that paper and talk a little bit about the larger context, um, which they kind of take for granted but don't actually touch on. So there's pretty good awareness now that we're going to have to stop emitting CO2, um, it, except for a portion of the population in active denial. There's pretty good global understanding that that we need to stop emitting CO2. What very few people have really um, begun to understand is that if we stopped immediately today, the CO2 that we've already emitted to the atmosphere is not going to go away quickly by itself. That um, the way CO2 comes out of the atmosphere mostly has to do with the geologic carbon cycle, which takes thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands of years. So the fallout for CO2 from the atmosphere by itself, you get a little bit of short-term biological fallout, but once you're done with that, it, it takes a very, very long time for it to come down by itself. And if we allowed the CO2 level to stay high, even at current levels, we would have continued climate forcing for a very long time. The amount of climate forcing that we're getting now is not from the CO2 today, it's from the CO2 some years or decades ago. And if you allow that level to stay elevated, even at today's level, you would continue to force the temperature up for probably thousands of years if we, if we look at these curves. If we look at where CO2 has been over a, a long period of time, over the period of time that we've essentially been human, never mind civil, civilized, we can see back 800,000 years in ice core data. And using this ice core data, we can see what the CO2 level looked like. And it fluctuates in a range. And the top of that range, the red line, is 280 parts per million. The blue line is about 180. So this is the natural biological envelope. And you can see that if you go back about 400,000 years, the, the top of the curve wasn't at 280, it was maybe 250. So there's very good evidence that the, the natural biological system has been fluctuating a range for a very long time. The top of this range is the brief interglacial periods. The bottom of it is the depth of an ice age. So the whole range between the depth of an ice age and an interglacial period is 100 parts per million. That's the natural range. We're now <coughs> above 380. So we're as far above the top of that range as the depth of an ice age was below it. And we're actually almost 400, or like 392 or something last I looked at. 396. 396. So I, I'm not, it's, we're effectively at 400 for the purposes of these discussions and rounding numbers. There's a lot of debate about how far we will allow things to overshoot. Personally, I think that all of this debate is complete hallucination because we are going to flip from denial to panic sometime over the next years, decades. The, the magnitude of what we're causing will come home to us if it, if it hasn't already witnessed the, 
the floods in Pakistan and the, you know, Russia being on fire, we're, we're already seeing severe effects that are being forced from previous levels. So the idea that, that humanity is going to go merrily along pumping more of this stuff out for, for 100 years from now is completely wrong. But we could do a lot of damage in the next couple of decades while we stay in denial. And then whatever we do, no matter how hard we try, it's going to take us a while to pull back from emitting carbon as a result of producing energy. <coughs> so the question that, that I've been interested in for quite a while and have had a lot of difficulty getting an answer to is what is the relationship between one part per million of CO2 just been saying that we're almost 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. What's the relationship between a part per million of CO2 in the atmosphere and a ton of solid carbon? How much carbon would we have to take out of the system and retire in order to bring the CO2 level back down by one part per million? Well, you can do the math, and a part per million is about 2.1 petagrams, or we've heard it recently in terms of gigatons of carbon, billions of tons of solid carbon. So first pass, one part per million of CO2 is about 2 billion tons of solid carbon. But on the way up, the oceans have been absorbing carbon. And so that's been actually damping the effect of the CO2 level in the atmosphere because as we've been going up, the oceans have been absorbing carbon and masking how much carbon we've been putting into the air because they've been pulling it out. So on the way back down, this carbon would have to come back out of the oceans because the air and the oceans are in equilibrium. So as that level drops back down, we'd actually have to pull about 3 billion tons of carbon out of the atmosphere in order to bring the CO2 level back down by one part per million. Now the problem is that at our current level, the oceans absorb that carbon at the expense of making the oceans more acidic. And the acid level in the oceans is already at a point where calcium-based shells of, of organisms in the ocean are not able to form because the acidity level is getting too high. So this says that all those figures about how high the CO2 level could go, even if we could handle the temperature, the, the storms, the droughts, the ocean level rise, we would still be vulnerable to basically crashing the food chain in the ocean by getting this acidity level too high. So this is going to be one of the, the huge drivers forcing us to act more quickly. The good news is if we could start to bring the CO2 level down in the air, we could start to drop the acidity level in the ocean. But it means we're going to have to do that work in the ocean as well as the air. So the, the, the point of today is that we're participating in, in an organization for 350.org. And, and 350.org is the, the only organization that came out or just came out first pointing out that we're going to have to bring the CO2 level back down below it is where now. And this number came out of a lot of inane discussion about how high we could take the level to 450, 550, 750 beyond. And Hansen came out and said, no, it's not 750, it's 350. You have to go down. After throwing out that number as sort of a, a symbolic indicator of, of you know, which of these milestones we could go to, they started looking at more and more detail about how far do we really have to bring it down. And what we're now hearing is that we 350 may be a safe maximum. It may be still too high. 300 may be a safe maximum. It may still be too high. If we look back at that ice core data, the biologically validated number is 280. That's what the planet has done for at least 800,000 years. And it's done so consistently, so we've probably done a lot more than that. So 350 is great in that it, it's a symbol right now to the world that we actually have to pull the CO2 level back down. But as a target, it unfortunately is very likely still too high. <coughs> 
so if we were going to get down to 350, even if it were too high, and we need about 3 billion tons per part per million, and we're at 400 now, we would have to pull at least 150 gigatons of carbon, net carbon, out of the atmosphere just to get from where we are now, if we can instantly freeze emissions, down to 350. 350 is probably too high, and we're going to go higher than we are now. So we're likely facing 300 gigatons, 600 gigatons of solid carbon that we're going to have to pull out of the atmosphere over time. A lot of policymakers who have not really taken any of this on board, and I'm including people in the part of the climate science community that are thinking about geoengineering, are assuming that we're going to do this through something called CCS. This is the, the technology that doesn't yet work that they're assuming they're going to use for coal plants. So the assumption is that we're going to take gaseous CO2 out of the gas from a coal plant and pump it underground. And then you extend that line of thinking and you assume that we're going to take gaseous emissions from burning biomass and take that gaseous CO2 and pump it underground. The problem is that the number of formations you would need to do this are just a huge volume. And the few places where they begin to experiment with it, you're getting produced chemicals being pushed up to the surface by the CO2 pressure, and, and it's, it's not working. So this is the silver bullet that most of the people thinking about this assume right now is going to be the solution. Now, there are other solutions, of course, other techno fixes. Uh, one of them is synthetic trees that we're going to take gaseous CO2 out of the air with these devices, but these devices have to be powered with energy. So you would not only have to have enough carbon-free energy to meet human needs, you would have to have a bunch of extra energy in order to run these devices to actively take carbon out of the atmosphere. There's, there's another approach where you could mine calcium carbonate and put that into the ocean, either by calcining it first, which takes even more energy, or just putting it in the ocean. This mimics the, the geologic carbon cycle. But again, there's a lot of energy to mine and move this, this rock, and you don't get very much benefit for each unit of it that you put in the ocean. So you're talking vast amounts of mining and movement of heavy materials in order to try and, and work on the problem. Yeah. And uh, we... Okay, we need to work last. Okay, I'm actually going to keep going yeah, while you play with it. Um, we, we won't have the little visual cues, but it'll work okay. Um, another thing that, that people are talking about are land use changes. And this is a very sensible thing to do. It's by far the cheapest thing we can do. So one of the few beneficial things that we got out of the UN process this last year, and that's a lot of failure, was the RED initiative to deal with forests, um, stopping and, and reversing deforestation, going to afforestation. Um, it's a tremendously sensible thing to do. Um, the slide was actually talking about um, some of the rangeland practices that Alan Savory and others have been working on, where if you improve your grazing practices, you could actually get more carbon into the roots of grasses. But the important thing to do, if, if you want to think theoretically about what can we get from land use changes, if 10,000 years ago, before humans were here, nature was socking up as much carbon as it could, and over the time since the invention of agriculture, we've started doing things in ways that held less carbon than it used to, and so we've emitted that carbon into the air. If we were to reverse those changes and get our practices to be perfectly as good as what nature was doing before, we could still only pull back as much carbon doing that as had been emitted by those bad practices over the last 10,000 years. So, you know, there's, there's maybe, if we're really lucky, 100 gigatons